Hey everybody, this is Paul, and as you can see, these plants are happy. Now, this is the results of my experiment, and I'm going to teach you how I make my version 2 growing media now that I've been spending this season working with Vermistera. Now, first off the bat, I didn't believe that this would work, <laughs> but they proved me wrong. This is three parts coconut coir to one part earthworm castings. And the Lisa is just as large as the other cuttings with new growth, as you can see, compared to my soil mixtures. So, wow, that's pretty cool. Two ingredients in that growing media, and these plants seem happy. Now, in addition, I also tried to root these really young, immature condor cuttings, which normally sometimes will rot. People would say, hey, they would never recommend or sell these, so don't ever buy dragon fruit cuttings this size, please. I mean, if they give them to you, that's fine. But look, I got them to root. So that's just coconut coir and earthworm castings. And these are my growing media. So in just four weeks, they've all rooted and they're doing great. They're plumping up already. So let me go show you how and why I've revised my soil mix. So basically, this is what it looks like when it's done. The only problem is I cannot hunt down any pumice. I like to add a little bit of pumice. I can't source it anywhere. I guess it's a supply chain issue or something. So here we go. Let me show you how to do this. Now, first you gotta take your coconut coir and make sure it's ready for plant material and has all three parts, the pith, the husk, and the chips. And you get it wet and then get it nice and broken down like that. That's your first step. Step two. I'm going to add plenty of worm castings to this. About three to one. Maybe four parts to one or so. Remember, you don't want to breathe any of this, so I like to just let it kind of dissipate. All right. Okay, so you don't breathe that, that's step one. Next, I add some perlite. Make sure it's OMRI certified or organic. And you actually probably should, you should rinse it out beforehand, but today I'm not gonna do that. But this is really good stuff. I believe it's been clean, but it is a good rule to wash your perlite. Okay, next I'm gonna add some vermiculite. This will add soil uh, moisture retention. It will keep your soil loose and definitely add some minor trace minerals and nutrients. So that's the next step. Okay, so now the most critical step is using a high quality potting soil. I really like Happy Frog's potting soil by Fox Farms, that's what I use. Here we go. I like to make it about 50%, 50 50. be good all right so here is my tool of choice and again you don't want to breathe this I'm, I'm gonna be holding my breath and walking away it looks weird but uh, people have died from inhaling the I guess the mushrooms and fungi that are in maybe potting soil that sat in the Sun so be careful when working with it and again wear a mask or hold your breath like I do
Whew, so there you go. That's what it looks like. Dry. And I honestly can set wet cuttings into this if I keep it out of the water in full shade and it will not rot them. And then after about a week, 10 days, I start watering them lightly on the plant flesh and the root, not a problem. Today I'm gonna to show you a new strategy I'm using to get cuttings to root quickly during the growing season. Now hopefully you saw our last episode, that was Scott's Dark Star. This one is my Dark Star, and it takes full sun quite well in our area in Southern California. And it's topping the trellis nicely, and it's actually getting quite crowded down below. Now believe it or not, this was one cutting 15 months ago, and I've actually given away three cuttings. So anyways, this piece right here, it's getting a little crowded on the trellis, so I'm gonna take this cutting here in a moment, and I'll show you why I selected this one, is because it's a little crowded over here, and the tip of this branch here has been eaten by the bugs, so it's gonna stop growing there. So this will be a nice, large cutting for me to propagate. I really like Dark Star, and that way I can replace it with this lovely two-sided piece that came from a graft of the Dark Star from the same plant, same DNA. So all this is the same. But look at that two-sided, pretty interesting. So anyways, I'm gonna take this cutting right now, and then I'm gonna show you my new strategy. And I think you're gonna find it quite interesting, or at least I hope you do, and I've been very successful with it so far at 100% success rate this season. So it's really quite simple. I always label my dragon fruit here, and I take a nice cutting right here, the callus. So I'll get right and zoomed in for you. It's a little hard to do one-handed, sorry, there we go. And I like to take my cutting right here, right at the base. So let me do that now. Just like that. Okay, so let me take this off of the tape here and go get set up and I'll show you what to do next. Okay, so it's been about three to five minutes since I cut that cutting. And so now I'm gonna sprinkle some rooting hormone. I like to use Hormex number eight, just a light sprinkle. It's the product I use, it's great. And so once I sprinkle it on there, this cutting, I immediately place it onto my growing medium, just like that, and leave it alone for about a week. So this is Fox Farm and Coconut Coir and Worm Castings from Vermistera, and it's all mixed up and I do not water it, it's dry, and again, just leave all that alone for a week in the full shade. This is the shady side of our greenhouse, and it's been working really well for me. Now in a case like this cutting, I did, uh, this is a flesh to stem hack, I would not recommend doing it th this way. You want this to callus over because you're gonna get rot in here if you do it immediately. So uh, that is a different cutting. This works really well on a typical stem cutting. All right, let me go show you the inside the greenhouse. You can see the results that I've seen so far this growing season. So here we are in the greenhouse and all of these cuttings, I've done the same process and they're about two, three, and four weeks into this method and I've had great success. Now when I water them, and again this is during the growing season, I water them very lightly, just mainly onto the plant, very lightly, just like that, and that's about it on the plants up front. And I'll do that every day, every other day, until I notice roots and then I'll start drenching the soil much more. So I'm having much more success and faster success using this method. So I've had zero rot so far, knock on wood, but man, I really like using this strategy. It seems to get the cuttings to root quicker, especially if they are young cuttings. Today I'm gonna teach you how to score your dragon fruit cuttings if they're being very stubborn and not wanting to root. And you can see this is our peg style graft. It's totally attached. It's been like nine months, but the crazy sugar dragon didn't root. Now. I think sugar dragon has some salinaceous cetaceous genetics in it. Maybe the Hooten parent plant um, had it, but that's just my opinion. So anyways, they can be really stubborn. So what I like to do is I'll take a sharp knife and just score it a little bit. Just not too far, not too much. 
just enough to kind of trigger a response from the plant. So something like that. Now you can see I did it on the other end here and I finally got some roots. Honestly, it's been like nine months trying to get this thing to root. No joke, eight or nine months. So you can see I've scored it many times and finally I had success. So you can let it callus over for a week in the shade like most people do, but I like to just put mine in dry potting soil. In fact, I'll put a stick and stake it later and I'll leave it alone for in the shade for a week. And then I'll start watering the flesh every day. So what I like to do is I sprinkle just enough water to get all the flesh wet daily. Not so, I don't worry so much about the soil, but especially I like to water the plant. And then I have success rooting them. So I've had success with, that's an Israeli yellow cutting that I bumped off. And uh, that was actually quick to root. But this one, yellow tie, it took about eight or nine months to root. It's very, very challenging. I even tipped it and I had to score it several times. Same with yellow cross 68. That one required, I had to tip it and that didn't seem to trigger a response, so then I had to score the, the other end of it as well. Now, with Selenoceres varieties like Selenoceres validus and the Princess of the Night, uh, they tended to rot when I was trying to get them to root in the winter. So what I did is I waited till it warmed up and provided extra drainage, perlite, pumice, vermiculite, into that fox farm soil. It's about 30, 40% fox farms, and the rest of it's really good drainage and that seemed to really help them to root and to grow and develop, as you could see. So definitely Selenoceres and Hyloceres can be challenging to root sometimes from cuttings, depending on the genetics and my humble opinion. So my advice is to make sure you score it if it's being difficult. Now dragon fruit are actually epiphytic night blooming cacti and they're very drought tolerant once established. This plant would survive here on just rainfall alone, but it would never flower or fruit. And dragon fruit have a special adaptation, and it's called CAM, C-A-M, CAM, photosynthesis. And what that basically means is that their stomata will open at night. So in here, the stomata will open at night and they basically delay the timing. They change the timing of photosynthesis, which is amazing to me. So in Paul Thompson's book, he talks about a friend that was using drip irrigation and having great success. So I use drip irrigation and I water during the growing season every other day, just for a short duration in the evening because the best time to water your dragon fruit is actually around 10 o'clock after the soil cools. Now in this case, I watered these recently and uh, I notice when it's time to water, the soil will come dry up a bit and there'll be a little gap between your pot and your soil. And that means that's when I know it's time to water my dragon fruit. So I don't need to water this anymore, but I do want to show you, I will additionally do a, a drenching and I'll use either a compost tea or just the hose water. And I water it about seven to 14 gallons per week for this 20 gallon pot. Now, Linda Nickerson used about five to seven gallons a week on her mature plants and said that was sufficient. So again, I use about seven to 14 gallons of water during the growing season. Now in the winter, I don't water at all. I only let rainfall. Uh, water the plants, but I do run the drip if it's going to be a frosty night because uh, wet mo moist soil will retain more heat than dry soil. So that's a good tip. So I only water during a really cold time of year to keep the plants from freezing. All right, let me go show you in the greenhouse. All right, so here's the greenhouse and basically this section is my rooted section. So anything rooted, whether it be grafted or not, I have them in this side of the greenhouse and I will water them really heavily almost every day. So I usually actually use a smaller one, it takes longer, but I really wanna show you how much water I like to give them. So definitely a lot of water about every other day to every day, 
I would say five to seven times a week, depending on the heat and the temperature in our area. Now on the other side over here, I have the non-rooted section. So most of these are just barely getting rooted. Some are very hard to root, like Yellow Cross 68 or Yellow Tie. So what I will do is I'll just give them a lot of really light watering, but mostly on the plant flesh. So again, mostly on the plant flesh until they will root. And I use a bit of rooting hormone, which I hope you've seen our episode on as well. And then I'll check them every week or so. So some of them just take their time. So that's what I do, a much lighter watering on my uh, new cuttings that I'm rooting and again mostly on the plant flesh. So earthworm casting tea is different than compost tea because you're not going to have to aerate this for a few days. You're not going to have to deal with any E. coli bacteria growth and this product is shelf stable. So it will last for a year and I believe it takes them several months to make. So they probably have some interesting process that they use to create this product. Now once it's um, watered down or diluted I should say I like to do it three ounces per gallon this is three ounces of it I love this well, I don't know if I love the scent but it has a very unique smell but what this stuff is gonna do when it's diluted it's gonna break down the soil uh, nutrients in that Fox Farm soil that back guano that they apply and it's also gonna help break down that uh, salt so you can even use this as a foliar spray once I dilute it. So what I like to do is I put it in here. And as you can see, I leave my tap water out. Now you can use tap water straight from the hose, but I like to let mine sit out for a few days to kind of minimize uh, cold shock and, uh, to the plant roots and also to get that chlorine to kind of get out. Now, uh, get out of the water. Now the key is you want to apply it weekly and apply it a little bit over time, meaning you're not gonna necessarily see results immediately, but you're gonna wanna apply this product throughout the growing season. Uh, I use it every few weeks, but again, if your plants are nutrient deficient, you can do this weekly, which is awesome. Okay, so this is cotton candy, and I just top dressed it with Burmistera earthworm castings. Now, look at the low MPK. As you can see, you can use this monthly during the growing season. Very high quality, odorless, and these are the standard, this is the standard grade, but still, it's perfect for the dragon fruit. Now, I used to use chicken uh, manure, composted chicken manure, but now I don't use that because the more I learn about soil, I'm starting to understand that chickens often eat uh, corn and soy, and that can be undigested, and that's great nitrogen for the soil. However, that will lure pests and nematodes, which you don't want in your soil. So I'm stopping uh, chicken manure, and I'm just gonna use these earthworm castings and the tea that I'm about to apply. So if your soil has issues or you have weak plants, you're definitely gonna see results quickly. I kinda just noticed my plants seem perkier or happier, I guess you could say. So now I'm gonna show you how I soil drench the soil during growing season for dragon fruit. Now you can, again, apply it onto the plant if you wanted to, but I typically like to drench in those earthworm castings and get those beneficial microbes and bacteria and nutrients into that soil quickly. So again, I use the earthworm castings monthly and you can use this compost tea weekly, Burmistera compost tea. I use it every two weeks or so right now as I experiment with it, but I see no plant burn or I see no, no negative effects at all. I love, I love this product, I'm stoked on it. So again, as I soil drench it, there we go. And now I've added some nutrient uh, rich material that has lots of beneficial microbes and bacteria and fungi. And now I don't have to worry about nutrient deficiency or hopefully less disease and pest problems because healthy plants will usually fend off those pests and disease. So there you go. That's how I apply uh, Vermistera earthworm uh, castings and their Vermistera earthworm casting tea. 
Man, you got a lot of different kinds of trellises around here. Well, that's the most important thing with dragon fruit, Scott, is you gotta have a, a really strong, sturdy trellis and think five, seven years ahead. Because in time, something like this, this is our first trellis. It's a, it's a great trellis. It's similar to spicy exotics. Um, this is actually hollow. Right. So what happens is you can see it does move a bit. And as long as you balance the plants out, it should be okay. But I think in time, Ty has had to apply straps to his. Right. So I thought, all right, this is great. But five, seven years down, it's not going to be sturdy. So you saw our palm tree trellis, which should be pretty sturdy. And let's talk about some more. I have several different methods and let's share them with you. So come check them out. This is kind of my version two trellis. And you can see I used three inch drain pipe and I actually stuffed it with some rebar and concrete and I went two feet down. So it's very sturdy. It holds my uh, Thai white and my Asunta four really well. Now a quick note about mixing varieties. If at all possible, I strongly suggest that you keep them in separate pots. Now in this case, this is my Thai white, which is a Hylocereus undatus on the left. Very, very aggressive variety of dragon fruit versus my Asunta 4, which is a hybrid. And I believe it has Epiphyllum background. So one is much more aggressive and hardy than the other. And in time, I'm worried that they will not live in a symbiotic relationship and compete for nutrients in a pot. Now, the reason why I kept these together, didn't just separate them and mess up the roots, is that I'm hopeful that my extra holes and the big hole that I put in the bottom of the pot will promote that the roots are gonna leave the pot and trace, or tr uh, track, I should say. They wanna track down those nutrients that leach out of this high quality mixture. And as you can see, this is the Hylocereus undatus roots most likely, or one of the dragon fruits roots have already come out of this pot. And I'm sure there's plenty more going down in the holes that I provided. So use caution. And I'll talk more about it and show you what I found online and in books about mixing varieties. All right, let's get back to the trellises. So you can see it's a similar design. It's actually slightly shorter. I'm using about four feet here. So using concrete, it's much more sturdy. And I did have to drill a big hole in the pot, as you can see down here. And I'm using either 15 or 20 gallon pots all the way up to 25 gallon pots. So. I, I prefer this method, but let me go show you kind of version three where I think it's even better. Let's go check it out. Okay, so this is my version three using trellis system where I stuffed a four inch drain pipe with concrete and rebar. So that extra inch, it did require a bit more concrete, but to me it's worth it. It's extremely sturdy and it houses this very unique variety here I'm, uh, we're assessing right now. So this is some old DNA that I've collected and a lot of it's four-sided looking guatemalensis. So I'm excited to see what becomes of this plant. So I'm happy that it has such a great robust trellis that I'm not gonna have to worry about it blowing over or falling over in the future. So one thing I forgot to mention is that the version one trellis, like Spicy Exotics, a huge benefit is that you can move it. It's not permanent. So in this case, my Hana did great for a full season and then started to get really bad sunburn this season just because the intensity of our sunlight, I don't know, did fine for about a year and then got really damaged. So I pulled it up into this shady environment so it gets much less sunlight. And you can see it's really bouncing back as you can see the new growth. And again, there's one huge positive thing about this is that it is mobile. So if you have to move your dragon fruit, you can do this with a dolly like I did. It was pretty hard to move it up the hill, but it's possible. So let's go show you if you don't want to use this style trellis and maybe you have a, a fence or a chain link fence or some type of fence. Let's go show you another method that we use. All right, so here's another design if you have a fence like we do. And you can see I designed or I, I hammered in some seven foot metal posts because I want the majority of the weight to be on this structure here. And then I ran a hundred pound uh, vinyl coated wire that I found at Home Depot, it was pretty cheap, and I strung it through, so most of the weight will be supported onto this. Um, this is sort of an adaptation of the Israeli method. They do really long sections like this and plant really dense under shade, uh, a canopy, a, sh a shade canopy, shade cloth. So I like this method, but again, if you pan down in time, you're gonna see that the sheer weight of all these plants will probably make this fence fall over. So as long as I prune it back, 
and don't let um, too much of the dragon fruit overtake this fence. It should be an excellent trellis support. So another good method is I could move the pot if I had to. Obviously this plant is too large by now, but if I had to, I could prune it back and save the plant maybe if it was uh, a frost was coming or something. So this is another design that we really like to use as you can see, and it's been pretty efficient so far. All right, so we did a video on this. I call it the double decker trellis. Now, it was probably the most expensive trellis I've made so far, but uh, we have two versions. We have a single story and this is the double, the two story. And my reasoning or logic is that this, the plant here, Trinidad, is gonna climb up and go up to the top and my sun loving varieties will be on the top to provide shade for some of my more shade preferring varieties, my white fleshed, my, uh, what do I have in there? Alice Snow and it's probably gonna like less sunlight. So I will have two stories to harvest. I'm not sure how it's gonna go in a few years. I can envision this being quite full. Yeah, you're learning too. Yeah, but I, again, I wanna prune out that growth. So these trellis, trellising methods should work great as long as you keep your plants pruned and don't let them get out of hand. But wow, I really like this setup. It's very sturdy and the plants seem to love it too because I planted these just about four and a half months ago from cuttings. So you can see that I think it's gonna work out fine. All right, let me show you another trellising method or two that we have still up our sleeves. Let's go check them out. So I don't know what you call this, but I call it the retaining wall trellis, I guess. So what I did is I have a well draining pot. I drilled some holes into this ceramic using a special drill bit. And this is an unknown variety that seemed to be a white flesh and very shade loving. So you can see it's gonna kind of just grow on this really shady wall. And I suspect it's gonna do okay. My only concern is it may get some damage from the frost in the winter if uh, this wall gets too cold. But luckily in our climate, I think it's, it doesn't get that cold. We have very short durations of cold weather. So it's gonna be fine here. And you can see all the new growth. I mean, check this out. So I got this cutting in, these cuttings in the end of March. So they're doing great. And it, this is a definitely very sensitive, I would assume white flesh variety. So let me go show you another trellis and it's my favorite one. Hey Scott, come check this out. Let's see if it rooted yet. Uh, George Emmerich Jr. number 48. This is easily the longest cutting I've ever tried to root. And nope, nothing yet but I will start to give this a little bit of water. And again, I'm gonna water the flesh. But this idea, we saw at Armstrong Garden Center and they had this giant guatemalensis on a rock and it was full of flowers. So that gave me an idea. I said, oh, I have a nice rock here. Let's see if we can put this dragon fruit on a boulder and let's see what happens. So I'm excited to let this root and hopefully it's just gonna fill up nicely on this boulder spread out. And this cutting is about 12 feet long. So I'm gonna give it some water, water it lightly, and it should root in no time. And it's gonna spread over and just be gorgeous. So I like this trellis method. I think it's kind of cool. So to treat and protect my dragon fruit from pests, that's all I do now. So this is a graft, but I could show you on new growth as well in a minute. But what I use is diatomaceous earth in a mason jar, and I poke some holes in it. Now you don't wanna breathe it, but Diatomaceous earth is uh, food, this was food grade and uh, natural and non-toxic. You do not want to breathe it in, but uh, it's basically uh, tiny fossilized diatomes or plankton that have accumulated over time in uh, freshwater lakes. And it tends to be high in silica and other minerals, and it's actually used as a health supplement, believe it or not. So I'll zoom in a bit for you. And now you can see, um, that it works as uh, pest control. Now, health su supplement, I said, a stain remover, deodorizer, and people even mix it with their food for storage so it will last longer. This uh, diatomaceous earth that I got is Omri listed, and it, I prefer it more than neem oil now because neem oil tends to make the plant greasy. So uh, I'll show you what it looks like on new growth um, on a more mature plant. So let's go check it out. All right, so here's a nice young shoot. This one's rather more spiny, so I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But uh, now I just pretty much spray, spray a little bit of water and sprinkle that diatomaceous earth on the growing tip. So that's what I do. I don't breathe it in. You do not want to breathe in diatomaceous earth, food grade or not, organic or not, it's not good for you to breathe. 
So that's about it. That's all I really do. And it seems to be more effective than using neem oil. All right, you could do it on flower buds too. So again, I just use a little bit of water just to help it bond, stick to it better. And then sprinkle a little bit of diatomaceous earth, diatomaceous earth onto the flower buds like so to really annoy those pests so they don't want to attack my young fruits or stems. Good morning, this is Paul, and today I'm noticing a lot of ant activity here on my Selena series cuttings here on my flower buds, especially on the Princess of the Night. So what I like to use is neem oil. I've talked about it before, but now I believe a lot more in a cold pressed product, especially one with no additives. Now I found this on Amazon, and as long as I think it's cold pressed and additive free, and organic like this one you should be fine and there are the directions for use that you'll want to follow now honestly I kind of mix it a little bit lighter than directed and I make sure to use a dish soap to bind it to because it's it's hydrophobic so the oil so it is pure organic and this is kind of what it looks like when it's ready to go and notice that this one I didn't shake it so overnight it's kind of separated see how the neem oil is on the top layer so it's really, really important that you shake it really well right before you spray it. So I shake it quite often and it will last about a week or so here and it's great product. So all I really do is just spray lightly, especially I tend to spray on the new growth and if the ants are on the plants at all. Now honestly in the greenhouse I tend to spray down here on the base more to kind of make a barrier. So it tends to treat the ants for a few days. So let me get up close and show you. Okay, so I just gave it a light spray, just like this. And that's about it. That's all it needs. The ants really don't like the smell and it will kill them uh, on contact. So it's a great strategy because it's organic, it's not chemically, and you can do it on any parts of the plant. So you can give your fruits uh, light spray if the ants or aphids are damaging it and then this uh, neem oil will wash off easily at harvest time It's safe to use on flower buds too if You have a lot of ants hanging out on those flower buds and you don't want them there So it works on flower buds and let me show you it also works on the flesh So this is really common ant damage from the Argentine ants on sugar dragon here now what's really bizarre is they seem to only eat certain varieties and leave others alone. And they do eat the flesh slowly over time and will cause kind of that bunny ear effect on the tip, which is really annoying. So look at down here on this sugar dragon. You can see there's a party going on with the ants on the new growth here. So again, I like to just give it a light spray and it really annoys them for a few days. Now, be aware that it can uh, burn the plant with intense heat when it's really hot or if you apply it in the sun. Also, if it will sit on the plant kind of in the bend here where it's flat, so it will burn the plant or kind of cause a little rot. So just use it really lightly and it's more as a deterrent for these ants. And again, I almost prefer to just give it a nice spray on the barrier, create a barrier on the pot more than anything, and that seems to work pretty well. Today I'm gonna to talk about tipping your dragon fruit and the best times to do it. So many people do it in March, April, May in Southern California, but I wanted to see what would happen if I did it in the middle of winter. So I did this one in, I wanna say December, late December and I covered it with a paper bag, or plastic bag, excuse me, because it was raining. I wish I cut it at a 45 degree. I'm learning I'm gonna always cut my tips at 45 so the water doesn't sit on it and will cause rot. Now when you tip your dragon fruit, you can see this is about four feet up, three and a half feet, four feet up. You're gonna get a lot of new growth there, see it all? So it's just bursting up high here, near where I tipped it. And so, that's what you want. And even one, let's see, yeah, I think I'll let that go, but I could pop it off if, if I was uh, 
wanted to channel more growth upward. So anyways, it's really taken off. There's even some new growth in there versus here's something when you don't tip it. So again, I wish I would have tipped all these at a 45, but I just wanted to try this one plant, plant Hana, to see the difference. So I, I hypothesize if I tipped it here, cut it at a 45 degree angle, I'd have some new growth there. Now, I did not tip this highest one either, just to see what would happen. You can see now it's just getting a new, new growth there, so it's gonna shoot another long piece. So that's kind of the strategy and reasoning by why people tip their dragon fruit because they don't want growth down low. So that's kind of the logic and I'll show you. I did not tip this one. I am gonna move Cosmic Charlie because I'm gonna have all single varieties in my pots from now on. I learned uh, it's not too late for me to do that. So I'm gonna do that now. But anyways, uh, Cosmic Charlie here, I did not tip. And what I did is I had some new growth way down low. That's what you don't really want because you want a, a single piece going up to the trellis and umbrella. That's how you're gonna get more fruit. So I broke these off to hopefully get more growth here. And so that is the logic for this Cosmic Charlie. However, since I did not tip this one, you can see I really wish I would have cut it here. Um, I, I may do that now after I move it. Um, but again, you just get much more rapid growth. So here's one I did in January, Dark Star, two months ago, I want to say, maybe mid January, I'd say. And I cut it at 45s and covered it with, uh, actually, it didn't rain, so I just let it be and it calloused over. It's doing great. Now the reason be why you want to cut it like this is so the water doesn't sit on it and cause rot. Now when I tipped it two months later, shot plenty of new growth there. Look at that. However, there was a snail here eating it, so I got took care of it. And that's kind of what snail damage looks like. Ant damage is more uh, circular. So in addition though, I noticed that it has a brand new bud here. Let's see if I could show you on the branch that I tipped. So it's right here. So that's the logic and reasoning behind tipping. And you don't just have to do it in the spring because I've done it to several plants. I have a few more I could show you, but they're all doing the similar, having similar results. So tipping is a good thing for dragon fruit. Otherwise you're gonna get a lot more new growth down low, which is not what you want. You want all your growth up here so this season, Dark Star, it's gonna be almost one year old. I got it in June, and it should start to have a nice umbrella here by June. It's only March right now. So there you go. I hope that explains tipping. And again, I'm having success doing it in the winter and the spring. So I just wanted to do a quick episode on this unverified ax. And I had five cuttings. So you can see I planted four, and I'm gonna graft one as it uses rootstock. Now, what I wanted to show you is this. Now, I've already cut off two, but this is just too many. So I wanna channel the growth upward as fast as possible. So I'm gonna prune off that one. So now I'm gonna tie it up. Awesome, it's pruned back nicely. All four cuttings are really close to the trellis. And I'm gonna promote all that growth upwards. So these cuttings have one to three new branches all at the top, and they're only six weeks old. So they're gonna to top that trellis really quickly. In addition, look at those epiphytic roots. That's why you wanna use burlap or wood trellis. They'll also attach to concrete. But what, what the benefit of that is, is that as they grow onto there and develop, they'll hold the plant onto your trellis and you can apply a foliar spray or water it with a hose to provide additional water and nutrients to the plant. So yes, I'm hoping to get flowers and fruit here. Definitely, hopefully next year. I wanna verify this and see the beautiful purple flower that Axe has. Hey, it's Paul and I wanna to talk to you about a canopy, your canopy growth and having a balanced trellis. So this is Dark Star and our trellis design here is the, the weight is supported in the pot and so when it's not permanent and when you have this design if you don't 
uh, distribute the weight properly on your canopy. In time, it may get heavy and bend over. You may have to use straps to support it, which I do, don't want to do at all. So as you can see, the weight of Dark Star, and it's, very, it's a very aggressive grower. This is 16 months of growth here. Um, and back in February, by the way, hopefully you saw our episode, I tipped it right here. And this was the only branch in February and I wanted to develop this canopy this season. So it's doing a great job. However, again, most of the weight is not distributed perfectly even here. So since it's early, we're catching it early, we can kind of manipulate the growth and tie it back a bit to promote it to be more balanced. So I don't know why I can't do this here. There we go. So I'm gonna promote the growth to be more distributed evenly and next season, I'm gonna have to prune a lot of it out because it's definitely gonna finish developing a canopy here. Now, when this one gets a little bit older, I'm gonna bend it over to go in this direction as well. Uh, Scott, if you see over here, you can see that you don't wanna to waste too much time because they will develop their epiphytic roots, even with young cuttings, and they're gonna to wanna, to, they're gonna wrap onto this and hold on tight. So it's gonna be really hard to move them as they mature. So let's see if I could save anything else. Looks like over here, I could probably balance this one out. And I think that's gonna be a much better situation in the long term for Dark Star here. Especially since this design is not gonna be as sturdy as some of the other trellises that we've shown you. So I think this definitely helps. And I'm not going to tip Again, I'm not going to tip any of this new growth this season. I want it to grow as long as possible. And man, I can't tie this today. There. So I'm just going to leave it alone for now. But again, you can see, I think it's a bit more d distributed evenly. What do you think, Scott? Does it look a bit better? Than it's looking better, you know? Yeah. I think, I think this still thing over is... over here, it's a little thin. Yes, yeah, it definitely seems like it has a little more on, you know, the right side at this point. But I think you'll be able to, to even it out. Yeah. But it's overall, I think it's more like thinking ahead, you know? Our sugar dragon flower has finally bloomed and it's time to collect some pollen. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, best thing to do is just get a bowl. I got a little bowl here and a little paintbrush, right? And should use a new paintbrush, something that is clean. And what we're gonna do is just gonna, a good way to do it is to put the lip of the bowl over the, the petals here so you can get the pollen. And then you're just going to knock it right off the flowers into the bowl. So lots of pollen is going to come off here. There's plenty, plenty, plenty. So the sugar dragon is known as a universal pollinator. So we're going to use this pollen to pollinate some of the other dragon fruit that bloom maybe later this month and later into the season. And um, we'll let this see uh, this bloom see if it'll fruit too. The sugar dragon have a real small fruit it's pretty tiny but it's really delicious so it's definitely got value but as far as commercial value i guess it's a little small for something you might see in the stores but i do think it's very good and we're going to go ahead and give this uh, flower a little pollination too at the end here so we're just going to hit the tip up and that should be pollinated these will these will close really fast, so by you know tomorrow morning this flower is going to be closed up, so you have a really short window in order to get your pollen. So you got to keep an eye on your flowers and know when they're going to open, because it's a really short bloom. So we're just going to continue just kind of collecting all this extra pollen here. And I know Paul is going to want this for some of his other dragon fruit, so we're going to put it in a baggie and give it to him later. Alright, well that's about it. That's pretty easy. And this is all the pollen we got, which is quite a bit. So we'll go ahead and store this for later use. Let's talk about when to harvest your dragon fruit. So these Laverne red fruits here are doing great. This is crossed with sugar dragon because Laverne red is a high low series guatemalensis cross that so it's self sterile and needs a cross pollination. So I use sugar dragon on the small one and pulled the flint spent flower bud. And on this one I used Trisha pollen and left the flower bud. So both fruits are doing great, but they definitely need more time here. Now, if you Google it online, it's recommended day 27 to 33 to harvest, and that is not 
good for these fruits right now. They definitely need more time. They have not even really turned color yet. Now, Spicy Exotics has Laverne Red, and they harvested day 30, but they have a much more hot and humid climate, so that probably accelerates the, the har harvest time. Richard from Grafting Dragon Fruit harvested his at day 40, and then he said 42 to 44. So, and they were very red. So we'll see here. I'm gonna probably estimate anywhere day 40 to 45. It's been rather mild so far this summer. So that's probably a factor here in our climate. And also, I think Laverne Red, there's different variants. They are known to grow from seed. And this version is very, very spiny compared to the other Laverne Red cutting that I have. So definitely noticed some differences on this plant. In addition, this Laverne Red is root bound. It was a donation with some flower buds. So it definitely needs uh, so a bigger pot and some better care. And I can't wait to do that after I eat these fruit. So that small pot could be another factor why uh, the, these fruits are different sizes, or it could be because I use different pollen sources. Okay, we'll learn more, but I'm excited to eat these fruit. All right, let's go check on Trisha. So Trisha is on day 30 and it's very undersized as you can see. Uh, been spraying some organic cold pressed neem oil to treat these ants and it works pretty well for a few days but they have not damaged the plant. I also did pull the flower bud off on this one or the spent flower bloom I should say and it's doing great but it's definitely going to need some more time probably day 45 or so. I'm going to leave it on as long as possible because I'm very interested to see what this fruit looks like inside. Now, I don't think it's gonna taste very well because you can see this is just on a small cutting, sort of the grand experiment here. And this is not advised, just to let you know, because your fruit's not gonna taste very good. And also, you're gonna sacrifice all that branch growth, growth for a whole season. So when you just let a small cutting like this fruit, you're definitely gonna sacrifice growth because most of the energy the entire season actually is probably going to go to rooting and this fruit production but it is a very cool looking fruit this is trisha and we'll see what happens today i'm going to show you how i like to harvest a dragon fruit so this beautiful laverne red is actually a laverne pink because i tried the small fruit yesterday it was ripe and lo and behold, this was mislabeled. This is a Laverne pink. So how do I know when it's ripe? Well, first pay attention when I cut this because you want to do the V cut. You want to cut it in a V so that way you'll prevent rot. This is not a v very good V cut and water could get stuck in there and cause rot. So uh, in addition, I have to harvest my fruit before it splits. If it, we get a split, we're gonna have ants in it uh, almost immediately. So they like dragon fruit more than me. In addition, um, I consider climate and weather during the growing season. This, uh, if you live in a really humid and warm environment, you're going to harvest quicker. In San Diego, for example, it's been cooler and foggier this entire season. So all the dragon fruit varieties are slower to ripen in my experience. Um, <clears throat> we're on day 45 right now and definitely I would say this is almost ready it's gonna need another day or two so I'm gonna leave this on the plant a little longer and I know this because also the color I think the color is just about there for what I like almost all that green has faded off it's a really nice size in addition to the color and you know, you need to be careful because say a Sunta 4, that, you pick that ripe when it's still green. So you also need to do what I call, or everybody calls, the wiggle test. So it's definitely on the stem. So it's still on there pretty tight. So this has a few more days. Um, that's the wiggle test. And then in addition, I like to look up really close on the skin and look for any wrinkles 
before it tends to wrinkle before it splits so I definitely think that this can take another day or two to get a little bit sweeter here so I can also call it the squeeze test it feels like there's a lot of resistance so it's really really firm in there I don't like to squeeze it too hard and bruise it so it's just about ripe and I'm really excited to see how this brick scores because when we got this in when was that April May it had flower buds on it and it was in a two gallon pot you can see there it's two gallon pot it's very small so a two gallon pot and it was severely root bound it's been in that pot since it was new it had all the nursery stickers on it so I think I can get a pretty sweet fruit I've been using vermistera earthworm casting tea every week on it so let's give this a few more days we'll cut it off and we'll go see how it scores. Okay, it's been two days and you can see that's the wiggle test. I think it's ready. I need to even go another day or two, but I'm ready to eat this. So watch carefully how I do this V cut. What you wanna do is you could go ahead and you gotta hold the fruit. You're gonna wanna cut it in the shape of a V here. And I learned this from my dear friend, Danny Loftus. And he says that he gets no rot when he does this method. So I get a little bit better cut there. there. All right. And I guess I didn't quite cut it here the first time. Sorry about that. There. That's perfect now. So the reason why you want to do this is you can look. It will allow the fruit to survive longer in the being refrigerated or even out on the counter because it has some of the energy in here versus if you pull it off all the way. Now I did notice also, what, this is the main reason why I pulled it off, it looks like some of the moisture from these foggy mornings in Southern California are starting to damage the skin of the fruit here. So it's definitely time that looks like rust, but it's not gonna mess with the fruit inside, so that's okay. So in addition, I'd like you to really focus on this wound now. So you can see here, let's see right there, you can see that now, as it calluses over, the water has nowhere to go versus in here, it could probably set or sit in there. So since this was such a bad angle with these two fruits here, I'm gonna recut this V cut. <clears throat> Oops. There. And so now this is gonna heal nicely and you'll get no rot. And then we'll still get some, hopefully some fruit from these little under these thorns here, Ariel's next. Wow, I'm just amazed that Laverne Pink, this little plant, produced such a large fruit. Look at that. So this is my Laverne Pink. I know that because I tried a fruit the other day and it was pink, even though this was labeled with everything from the nursery as a Laverne Red. So, it's a bummer with the dragon fruit. But anyways, I applied this stuff. I What I really did actually is I top dressed this with my soil mixture, which is happy frog, fox farms, happy frog, pumice, perlite, a bit of vermiculite and coconut coir. So I squeezed in as much of that, of that potting soil into the root bound pot as I could. And then what I did is I applied earthworm castings every week right here and tea. So I did those two in combination into this two pound pot and the fruit, the flowers opened a few days later after I started and it set fruit. Changed a beautiful color as well too. It looks much healthier. So anyways, this little plant, I, I did take one cutting. I must admit, I did take a cutting and gave it to a friend. So it's one cutting short, uh, but this little guy produced this lovely fruit. And let's see how sweet it is. Well, first, we should probably weigh it, huh? So I got this on Amazon the other day. I'll, I'll put a link in there. It seems like a good product, but I must tell you that the batteries were dead when it arrived. So I had to go take some from the TV controller. All right, 1.39. It's hard to see that there. All right, what is that in grams? 630 grams. Okay, I probably would have let it sit a little bit longer on the plant, but you could see it started to get 
some moisture damage it looks like it's from our foggy evenings we've had a lot of humidity so all right let's cut this open and let's see how sweet it is so i can't believe this laverne pink was mislabeled as a laverne red but that happens more often than you think and so check this out uh, this is the website and you can see that they have a few mistakes it looks like their labels are photoshopped the colors and I don't think that this is a Hyloserious Undatus. It looks like an Undatus Hyloserious Cross. So definitely more of a hybrid. And let's get to work. Okay, I am super excited. This is like officially the first fruit that is a full size that we've grown in the year into this journey on our channel. It hasn't even been a year yet. And look at that. Our new plant turned out to be a Laverne pink. It's definitely not white flesh. I see a pink tone. And the plant doesn't look undatus either, as you already saw. So, wow, what a stunning fruit. And I tasted the little one. It was really delicious, really balanced. So let's see how the big fruit tastes. Now, remember, it's going to be sweetish. Sweet and Swedish. It's going to be sweetest right in the center here and as you get near to the rind or the skin whatever you want to call it it's going to be more tangy in other words the sweetness will be higher in the center and lower if you were to bricks them in fact it's about five points difference believe it or not okay so here goes now notice the seeds are really kind of smaller than maybe trisha that you saw us taste the other day and it's very, very beautiful, fine texture. This is a commercial quality fruit, I would say. Mm. It's definitely sweet, tangy, smooth, soft, lovely. I really like pink flesh dragon fruit varieties. They don't kind of get enough love in the community, in my opinion, but wow, that is great. I'm gonna try some more. I should show it to you, huh? Getting a little bit too excited. Look at that. Lovely, lovely fruit. Mm. This is really sweet. And I'm glad I picked it when I did. All right, let's see the official bricks. That will always tell the tale. So again, right from the center, and the best thing, or the easiest way I can do it, is I kind of spoon it, eat it, of course, and then a little bit of, you can see, it kind of fills up like a little well or something. So you get that liquid out. Uh-oh. There we go. And let's see what it says. So, believe it or not, it's at a 21 and a half. Wow. Never underestimate the power of earthworm castings, people. 21 and a half. I'll show that to you in a second. I'm gonna leave that right there and I'll do a clip. It's a little over 21 for sure. So, wow, Laverne Pink. You can bricks at a 21 in a two gallon pot using earthworm castings. I think I'm gonna start growing my plants in smaller pots. I think 20 gallons is too large if, if I'm able to do this. But again, think about it in the long term. What's this plant gonna look like in a few years and what's it gonna be able to produce in the future? So wow, this is over 20 on the bricks. I am impressed. Good job, Laverne Nursery. All right, give us a like and a subscribe. Have a wonderful day.